This session is brought to you by Bloomerang. Bloomerang is a cloud-based donor management and fundraising software for nonprofits. Bloomerang offers an easy-to-use, clean, modern interface, all while helping nonprofits decrease donor attrition and increase revenue for better fundraising. To learn more, visit bloomerang.co. Hello, and welcome to Establishing a Legacy Program at Your Library. I'm your moderator, Christina McPhillips, and I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. First up, Cindy Sherrick has served as the Director of Donor Relations with the King County Library System Foundation for the past nine years, and where she leads the major gifts, planned giving, and special events. Next, David Baker is the Principal of Giving Design. David has 27 years of planned giving and major gift experience and has leveraged that experience for the past 16 years, providing comprehensive fund development services to public libraries, as well as library friends and foundations across the country through his firm, Giving Design. And with that, Cindy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Christina, and welcome to 40 Billion Reasons Why You Need a Legacy Program at Your Library. Um, our goal today, actually, is to share some important information about starting and setting up a legacy program at your library. And I'm gonna share a little bit about how we do it at KCLS. And uh, David's gonna start us off uh, why you should set up a planned giving program and some tips on how to set it up. And we'll end with 15 minutes of Q&A. So David, do you wanna kick it off? Sure, thank you so much. Um, it's definitely our privilege to be here. I'm excited to be here with Cindy. Uh, we're going to do some motivation and some background and uh, hopefully some uh, get some enthusiasm around plan giving and then end, as Cindy just said, with uh, some real time um, examples of all the good stuff that they've done in King County. Um, so let's get started with the motivation. So here it is. We had alluded to 40 billion reasons and I wanted you to know where that came from. And this is all about where charitable dollars come from. And you'll see we've got it circled there. 39.71 billion, and these are 2018 numbers reported by Giving USA uh, about a year ago. So uh, imminently, we'll have the 2019 numbers, but this is what we have right now. Uh, this hasn't changed. It's about the same. Uh, there's only like a 1%-ish change over the last several, several years that we've been doing this. So we know that 9 or 10% of all giving every year comes through bequests. So that almost 40 billion um, in 2018, and that is one of the primary planned giving vehicles that we're going to talk about. It's super relevant to your patrons and your prospective donors, your current donors, and uh, they're already exploring these things. We're going to we're going to walk through that here in a second. So um, that's it. That's sort of the opportunity. Um, it's interesting. Before we move on, a lot of times in my experience, we've we we start with corporations. Like whenever we've kind of moved from grant writing. You know, a lot of libraries um, have gifted researchers and writers. That's that's what librarians are uh, fantastic at. One of the one of the many things, and so so the grant writing piece is usually pretty robust in a lot of in a lot of contexts. And like the next decision is sometimes to chase corporate sponsorships and corporate gifts. Um, maybe today we'll give you some reasons to actually start working with your patrons on bequest instead of that. And you'll see, you know, almost double the giving from bequest versus corporations. Um, so just want you to think about that as you go forward. So we're going to move into this. Um, I wanted you to know, I, you know, we're not just making this up, you know, this is a, this is a good thing that has been done for years. And I wanted you to just get a real quick snapshot. You know, we're not going to dive deep into all of these, but I just wanted you to see the numbers. There's some, there's obviously some large libraries here, you know, New York public's down there with a, six million dollar gift uh, through a through an estate so these are bequest gifts these are all coming through wills or trust so 2014 six million dollars um, for new york public library but then there's a there's quite a few libraries of all sizes through here um, you know horry county south carolina it's a suburban coastal area but it's not a big city uh, 4.4 million uh, just just in 2019. Um, one of our clients actually, Sacramento uh, Public Library, two million in 2018. So you can just see there's there's a lot of reasons here and this is what we're talking about. Um, and in a lot of contexts and times, these aren't actually, these haven't been solicited. These are just patrons that have loved the library and they've like done this on their own. Um, so what we're trying to do today, what Cindy's been doing uh, in King County is just making sure that we're more intentional and we're making these opportunities available to everybody um, that we know 
loves the library, loves you. Um, so why would we talk about this now uh, in such a weird time? Well, it's because the time is now. Uh, so this is super interesting. And I, I, until I was getting ready to do this presentation for you all, wasn't even aware that this, is, well, this was happening. Um, but we went back and we looked and it turns out uh, that everybody, which obviously includes your, your patrons, your users, are looking about how to make a will. So this is Google um, Trends, and you'll see that in April of 2020, so just a little bit ago, the highest demand, the highest search in history, in the history of Google, for how to make a will. Um, so what we know is that your patrons are interested in this. They're out there trying to figure out how to do it. And part of this is we want to encourage you to, to help them, to be one of their guides and then as you are their guide, it could be uh, an opportunity for them to actually remember you in the context of their estate plan. So um, lots and lots of interest right now. Um, so that's, you know, that's a good thing. That's, that's the opportunity. Here's, this gives us a little bit of a sense of the scope of that opportunity. So this, and we got to kind of flip this in our head. So this is the percentage of people who have estate planning documents. So these are the people that have done it. This is super interesting. So caring.com, this is their 2020 estate planning and will survey. So this data was actually released in the first quarter right before all those searches happened, right? Does that make sense? So we have, here's everybody that's got a will or an estate plan, and then we see the spike. And the bars show who actually has them. And you'll see that there's actually been a decline. So 2019 is blue, 2020 is green. So in 2020, the folks that are 55 and older, there's actually less. There's less than 50% of the respondents in that survey that actually had a will or an estate plan. And then you saw in the Google Trends where those are probably a lot of the folks that are out trying to figure out, how do I do a will? I really need a will. So we know 50%. And this is going to start being clear why we're even talking about this in the context of libraries and friends and library foundations. The younger crowd, 35 to 54, um, the same. So the trend is down and actually having a will. Again, maybe that helps explain why there's so many people searching for how to do it uh, just a month or so after this data came out. Um, and that's really the opportunity, you know, to do this. That's the prime ages that people do wills. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But that's sort of that's sort of it. Um, when we think about like what so why are people looking? That's probably obvious. Um, you know, we've kind of gone through this regretful time with COVID and then even additional storms after that uh, related to, you know, things we're struggling with as a society. And so the obvious answer why people be looking for more of a will is that they don't have one. So this chart shows us that more than half of likely folks don't, don't actually have a will. So that'd be one of the reasons. And then, you know, why do we not do it? You know, sometimes those answers are maybe maybe even a little painful. You know, we don't like to consider our own mortality. Um, so we avoid it. We, you know, we're good at avoiding things we don't like. And then, you know, we also think that we don't need it now. Like this is something that's going to happen a long time out in the future. Like my demise is not near term. Um, and, you know, the reality is that this, the whole COVID-19 thing has changed that. It broke through some of that avoidance and that delay piece. So, Typically, when we aren't dealing with this type of a crisis that would bring back, you know, our mortality to mind, things that would prompt people to do a will are, you know, happier things, birth or adoption of a child or a grandchild, um, travel plans. We see lots of folks do um, their first will when they're taking their first trip uh, overseas, for example. Uh, but then also death of a family member, death of a close friend, again, things that bring our mortality into focus, uh, advancing age, personal illness or illness of another family member. So those are the things and that kind of helps with the psychology of understanding why now is a good time. Um, and it's not about just pitching them. This is about like serving your constituency. We're going to, we're going to talk about that as we move through here. Um, here's a little bit more where this, and we unpack the why people don't have a will. Um, this is actually also part of uh, caring.com's 2020 estate planning survey that we just talked about. So why do so many folks not have it? Um, haven't gotten around to it. So we've actually seen uh, that COVID has broken through that avoidance and delay. We saw this, you know, the spike in the searches. Uh, the second, you know, I don't have enough assets to leave to anyone. That's, that's what they think. 
Um, that tends to actually be a myth. It's generally not true. So this is an education awareness issue, and it's one of the places where I think you all have a role that we're going to unpack here uh, shortly. And then um, it's too expensive to set up. So in this, when we're thinking, why does that so many people not have a will? They said it's too expensive. Uh, and the reality is it can be free for a majority of your patrons. And again, we're going to talk about a service that I think fits nicely into your offering of adult programming. So it can be free and they just don't know it. And then this, you know, I don't know how to do it. You know, that's, that's part of the thing. So haven't gotten around to it, don't have enough assets, it's too expensive, and I don't even know how. Again, we saw that uh, in the Google search. And this, um, I guess, maybe intended sarcasm, you know, I would say if only they had a trusted guide that they had a habit of looking to for information. Um, and of course, that is someone like you. Here's a little bit more like sort of what's in my head, why this is so relevant. So literacy is your business, that's what it's about. And it's like all of the literacies, right? It's not just early childhood literacy. It's just not, it's not just reading. You know, we're, we've moved into the nutrition and we've moved into life skills. We moved into all the things. So sort of like all the literacies that you all are doing that help folks thrive and flourish. Like that's really what you're doing. You're like in the, in the thriving business and literacy is how you do that. So one of the things I'm suggesting is that now one of the one of the new literacies that I think we as libraries need to be involved in is a state literacy. We need to be helping folks understand that. We've seen through the caring.com study and then through the Google Trends, there's an appetite for the knowledge, right? People have a desire to know and there's a need there. And you all are the best. You're the best at equipping folks to make these decisions and to learn on their own at their own pace. Um, and part of this, and this is sort of the benefit uh, that goes back to the library, if you help be their guide, and let's just say it's their first will, we know that 53%, and you should write this down, 53% of donors establish their first legacy gift at the same time as their first will, and that's for giving USA. So if you help guide them, meet this need that they, they've already identified that they have, it is likely um, that if you present that there's also an opportunity for them to give back and to support the institution they love, um, that they will do it. A little over half do some sort of a charitable gift, even in their first will. So, you know, the estate literacy thing, um, I think this is your new service, legacy literacy. Um, and uh, that's like brand new. I just came up with that, even though I've been doing this plain giving thing and I've been working with libraries for years. Uh, I was thinking this is actually from an adult programming perspective, this is not just about raising money. This is about serving our constituents, our patrons, um, and in the end, having that be completely mutually beneficial. So legacy literacy, I kind of like it. I think it's something that we should consider as a new service in the context of, of libraries. So what exactly, in addition to just, you know, meeting the need, you know, the self-identified need that folks have identified with wanting to have a will or an estate plan. Like what, what, what else are we doing when we encourage them to include an estate gift? It's actually this, it's symbolic immortality. So just like we don't want to think about our own mortality, we do want to think about what's left behind. Like what's the memory that folks will have of us. And that's, that's actually what you're doing. So Legacy gifts are almost always, this is just a couple facts that sort of help build that. So legacy gifts are almost always the largest gifts donors will make. And it's kind of all over the place. And you're going to get a little more um, examples of these when uh, Cindy speaks in a second. But it can be this, all of these things. And some of these seem incongruous. So three times total lifetime charitable giving. So if they've been giving to you, um, uh, you know, a stay gift can be a, like three times. I've actually seen five times, ten times that. Uh, sometimes the legacy gift, like the estate gift, can be the first gift. Um, you know, sometimes there's been like one small gift. You would almost even think um, a token gift and then a million dollar gift. Uh, it's very possible. It happens all the time, actually. Uh, and then you can actually see the, the flip side of that. Sometimes the fact that a legacy gift has been included in a will is actually the start of more regular, robust annual giving. So it's a little bit of all of that. Um, but it's all about what's good for them. Th this is what I'm allowed to do. I don't, and it's always hard, I think, um, for you all to brag on yourself, uh, especially in this light. But when I think about legacy gifts 
the symbolic immortality for the donor. You know, what, what other institution besides the library is as beloved, has had as much lifelong impact on the donor, and has broad every person impact on the community? Um, I mean, not just because a significant part of my personal business is in libraries, but I like I think this as an individual. Like I don't I don't know. It's hard to know an organization like help someone when they were a child, help someone when they were in school, and then has been there for them and their family like through their entire lifetime. Um, most hospitals can't say that, uh, but the library can say that. And I'm still trying to figure out what other institution. And that's the kudos to you all um, for everything that you do and for everything that's relevant and meaningful. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity for folks to give back and to both pay it forward. Those are super strong motivators. We hear those. Uh, when I pulled up the list of those recent gifts, uh, a lot of those stories, you can actually Google those, uh, those gifts. You'll find out the story. Um, there's librarians that made those gifts. You know, there's like, you know, the, the person that no one thought had anything that made those gifts. And then there's people that just had their life changed by what happened in the context of the library and they wanted to, to support all of it there. Um, one of the things to think about, even as we talk about you being a guide, is it doesn't have to be exclusive. Um, I think this is one of the mistakes organizations make when they think, you know, this is our donor, that view. And I think if you just hold them loosely and you're their guide, and I mean, you may be helping them, you know, with their estate plan, encouraging them to get a will done. And they could be making a gift to friends of the furry critters as well as you, or even just to some animal group or some other you know, charity that's been meaningful to them. And that's fine because that's your role, uh, in my opinion. So, and I think if you do that, even more comes back to you because you've done it from sort of a rightly place as to them, what's important to them. So I do want to do real fast. Primary tools of plan giving. This is just a quick primer. You know, we're not going to dive into like charitable trust. We're not going to do any of those crazy things. Not going to try and make you a lawyer, but we're going to walk through these things. So real quick, just so we can wrap our mind around certain terms. So all deferred gifts are planned gifts, and deferred means, you know, the actual gift is realized at a time later, right? But not all planned gifts are deferred. So what's that mean? So let's let's we'll just think about wills real quick. So we've been talking about wills. So wills, we say that they are ambulatory until death. So basically the will doesn't speak until you die. So you, you, know, you can make the gift in your will and uh, you can change it any time before your death. Obviously you can't change it after your death, but you can change it any time before your death. And so then that is a deferred gift. We make it now, but it doesn't actually isn't realized until your death, till a point in time, till another condition happens, right? But not all planned gifts are that. So all of those deferred gifts, there's planning required. But then there are some immediate gifts, too, and some of those are really easy. So we want to talk about sort of that, that distinction. So it's not just wills. We spent all that time talking about wills. I think it's super important. But here's this. So there are other deferred options in addition to wills. And the top three here are retirement plan gifts, IRA gifts, and life insurance gifts. And you see we say that those are simple, uh, and that's because they are. It's usually just a form um, to do that. And most of the time now, a digital form, um, sometimes a signature required, sometimes it's digital now. Uh, it'll evolve till it's all digital eventually. But those gifts are very simple, like no lawyer required, right? So, you know, just simple education can help us get there. We're going to talk about the education piece. Um, giving real estate, but keeping it for life. So folks can actually give you their home. They could give you a vacation home. They could give you vacant land. They can give you commercial property. And then they could actually keep that during their lifetime. That's called uh, maintaining the life estate. And then you get it after their death. So um, very, uh, you know, lawyers are required probably at this point. Um, so not quite as simple, but still very meaningful from a gift perspective. So those are all deferred options, things that happen later. Um, other immediate options, things that happen now um, is this. So we can actually give stock. Um, oh. Apologize for that. So we can give stock, simple. Um, if you're a friends organization, a library foundation, or even the library itself, um, probably wise to have a brokerage account sitting there that's just there to actually receive gifts of stock, super simple. Um, giving from your IRA now. So if you're 70 and a half, 
some small modifications to that this year in the, you know, in our, in our COVID era, but for the most part, 70 and a half. And I said, tell your friends. So your friends organization is probably uh, ripe with folks that could do this. And it is true um, again, because what our, our own experience is not the relevant thing here. It is true that there's a lot of folks with IRAs who actually don't want to take the, the distribution that they have to. And if they knew they could give it to you, they'd happily do it. So that's one of the things we can do right now, every single year. Uh, giving real estate now, so we don't need to keep the life estate. We can actually just give it out right now. Lots of probably, again, some policies that have to be there. Cindy's going to talk briefly about that. Giving from a donor advised fund. These are like private foundation substitutes. You can think of it as a charitable checkbook. So the gift's already been made. It's sitting at either you know a local community foundation or with the Fidelity Gift Fund, and then they actually make grants to you. Um, those are great. If you had those relationships right now, the, those people have already made that gift. There hasn't been any impact, you know, to them personally to give from that. So good relationships to start. And then even giving part of a small business, um, lots and lots of lawyers probably and uh, accountants here in this part, closely held stock uh, makes a great gift as well. Again, not as simple as publicly traded stock, but it is something that could be there. And that's sort of getting to the, the advanced part. And I would say, but still even more relevant than most charitable trusts in most, in most cases. So not just wills, all of those things. One last thing here, just in case you're not convinced. So we've been talking about this wealth transfer for the last 15 years, I think at least. But when you look at this, 10,000 baby boomers are turning 73 every day. 10,000 turning 73. By 2027, not far away, eight to nine trillion will transfer and then an additional 30 trillion in the years after that. These folks are the folks that use your library. These are the folks that love you. And these are folks that would include you in their estate plan as they work through it. So just a little bit more, and this is a National Association of Charitable to Gift Planners. This is just a May 5th article that was talking about all of these numbers. So very timely and uh, very relevant, I think. How do we get started? And again, Cindy's gonna flesh some of this out for you a little bit, but it's really kind of two primary pieces. There's an education and promotion plan that you need to have. And then when people act on it, you got to figure out how we're going to celebrate that, how we're going to commemorate it, and then how are we going to continue communicating with them, you know, the folks that have done it. Probably has to be something a little special. On the education and promotion plan, this is all about awareness. Um, you know, part of what, you know, my work with libraries has been for the last 16 years is making sure folks understand that libraries are philanthropic opportunities, even though with all the different ways that they're funded, you know, primarily a tax funded entity, there's still um, room for private support to take libraries from being fantastic and great to exceptional. And that margin of excellence piece that private philanthropy brings is part of, you know, part of why we do this. We, we encourage people to, to, to be philanthropic, to be giving to the library. And part of the way we do this from a plan giving perspective, we want to make sure that there's bequest language available on your website. Again, whether you're the library or the friends or the foundation, bequest language there. We want to incorporate tools for giving into library communications, like the things we talked about, just real high level issue awareness um, things. And then we may want to have estate planning, basic seminars, classes, webinars in our current environment. Uh, I think Cindy's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then here, freewill.com, you should write this down, freewill.com is exactly what it sounds like. So freewill.com actually lets your patrons do a will that's valid in 50, all 50 states for free. And it actually asks them if they'd like to include a charitable gift. Um, so you can actually host a workshop where it's not about you. It's actually about one of your, you know, program folks, adult programming folks, walking them through this application online that creates a will. And then you could even have local attorneys be there for signing days and it actually could be a robust thing. And then figuring out how we're gonna celebrate, commemorate the gift. Um, you may wanna establish, probably do, some form of literary legacy or library champion society. Cindy's gonna tell you about theirs. Uh, and then there's gotta be some special things, right? So, and this is sometimes hard for us because we, you know, we're like this equal opportunity to serve everybody thing. But these are the folks that are really moving the needle. You saw those numbers, right? So we wanna include them give them a little bit of an insider feel. It could be coffee and tea with the director. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a crazy thing, but something special, something that makes them feel like they're a stakeholder, some sort of special communication. So that is, I think, what 
um, helps us get there. It's not hard. You know, it's a, it's a pretty simple roadmap on how to introduce plan giving to your constituents. So, and with that, I think it's time for Cindy uh, to tell you about King County. Okay, great. Thanks, David. That was fabulous. Uh, so we're switching gears and I'm going to um, share some basic information about KCLS Foundation just to give you some context. I know a lot of you are larger organizations than us and a lot of you are probably smaller. Um, our budget is $1.5 million. There are five staff members in our foundation office, our executive director, we have an accounting specialist, we have a corporate foundation specialist, community engagement specialist, and then my role, which is director of donor relations. And I do major gifts, I do plan gifts, and I do special events, which as you all know, can take over your life and your job. And so it's hard to sort of make time for all three of those very specific roles. Um, and so what I'm sharing with you today is just, I'm trying to be transparent to let you know that it, we're not perfect. We have a lot to learn and we're doing the best we can with the amount of time we have to dedicate uh, to plan giving. So with that, I'm going to move on to some suggested policies on the next slide. So the first order of business that I would recommend to you is if you don't already have them to get some basic policies approved through your board. Uh, review them, update them regularly. Um, you know, the last thing you want is to get caught off guard by promoting a plan giving program and then not having those policies, the gift acceptance specifically in place. Um, I'll tell you a, a quick story about my prior employer. Uh, when I started, I worked there for 12 years and when I started there, there was a piece of property that were on the books. That property had been on the books for years. They were tr actively trying to figure out a way to deal with it, it had environmental issues, it had right of way issues, it was a nightmare. And I left 12 years later and it was still in the books. I don't know if they ever were able to get rid of it. So make sure you have a gift acceptance uh, policy in place and that your board knows what to do when you are notified of these planned gifts. Also with naming, you know, uh, KCLS uh, Foundation is, uh, has a naming policy. We're allowed to actually, um, with gifts of certain sizes, name room, meeting rooms, and um, put names on our outreach vehicles. And so that policy is in place. It's approved through the system, and we're ready to go. And then as far as endowment, you know, um, right now all of KCLS's uh, foundation's unrestricted plan gifts go directly into our endowment. Uh, there are, the board can vote to use them otherwise, of course. Uh, they are not permanently restricted, uh, but our goal is to grow our endowment and provide annual support for high priority programs and services. So we um, want that to continue to increase in size. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it uh, later, but it's currently at $3 million and we're we're about to double it, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and then I'm, I wanted to offer to any of you that I am more than happy to share our policies with you for a, just sort of a template or a baseline that you can use to customize. Okay, so how do we do it? How do we communicate with our donor base? Um, these are some tools that we use. Uh, the most obvious one is just notifying our donors that it's an option. A lot of people, David mentioned this earlier, don't even think of the library as a potential um, resource or as a, as a potential um, recipient of their plan gifts. So we put it in our direct mail reply slips as just a little box. I've included KCLS Foundation in my estate plan or please contact me for more information. Uh, so those are on all our direct mail reply slips. Um, we we slip in a bookmark in our thank you letters about our literary legacy society that just has really basic information um, with my name and contact information. It's not a hard sell. It goes into all our thank you letters. Uh, we do a couple of newsletters a year, e-newsletters and hard copy email or newsletters, and we feature uh, recipients uh, that we are stories about the plan gifts that we have received. So 
we try to keep that uh, a broad uh, group. So sometimes we talk about wills and that we've received gifts through the wills. Sometimes we talk about gifts we received through an IRA or being the recipient of uh, real estate. We have a photo of the donor. We talk about who they were, why the library was important to them. We always list out the members of our Literary Legends Society. Uh, and so that's, that's just another way to remind people that it is an option for them. And we, our website presence right now is under construction. We're working on it uh, to improve it. But yeah, like David said, very basic information at a minimum. You can have bequest language and contact information on your website. Um, I actually learned about social media postings at a conference um, several years ago about the idea of posting regularly about plan giving on your social media channels. And so we just schedule it out. We don't do a lot of them, but we try to keep it um, in top of mind for the people who follow us on our social media. And then finally, seminars and webinars. And so uh, when I first started at KCLS Foundation, we were doing a, like two a year. Um, we would partner with a local uh, state planning attorney or a financial planner and come up with a topic. You know, we would, you know, order the food and arrange the room and send out the invitations and, you know, track the RSVPs and put together packets and do the reminders. And it was just a lot of work twice a year. And we were happy if we had 50 people there. And so in 2017, it was actually at this conference. In fact, I, I met up and partnered with uh, our colleague, my colleague at the Seattle Public Library System, Seattle, Seattle Public Library Foundation. And we decided to partner up. And it was such a great partnership. We would repeat the same seminar on the same day at two different locations, like one in the morning in the Seattle Public Library location and one in the afternoon at the King County Library location. And this would consistently get more attendance and we were able to split up all those duties and share all of it. And it was great, it's been a great partnership. Um, and then of course, we actually had a webinar or a seminar scheduled in May of this year and you know, the stay at home order came down and we decided that we needed to transition to a webinar, which we hadn't done. You know, silver lining in all this is, you know, we were had to be flexible and, and came up with um, a, a platform to have our seminar actually as a webinar. And as a result, we actually had 350 RSVPs. So we were thrilled. Um, you know, this the idea of planning for a virtual setting was so much better, so much easier, um, so much less details. So I would, I, I guess I just really wanted to suggest that if you can partner with your local other, another library system or even another nonprofit organization to share those responsibilities and you're going to reach a broader audience and uh, really uh, has been uh, great for us, you know, pays off to uh, share that workload. So. Okay, moving on. So prospecting, uh, how do you identify potential um, leads for your plan giving? Now I talked a little just now about having a seminar and the attendees at those seminars are great leads. Obviously they're thinking about making a plan gift and if your organization is hosting the event, you're top of mind. So that's a great, a great way to get prospects. Um, but obviously, um, I feel strongly that a commitment from your leadership is critical to your plan giving success. So um, your board of directors and your key staff members at the organization. You know, we emphasize plan giving uh, uh, when we onboard new board members as part of their onboarding training. And I also do an annual presentation to our full board on our status, what we're doing, what results we've had and you know that that has been a great way to you know pr uh, highlight that in a way for our board members of the importance and so we've had good success there 
And so I talked a little bit about staff and retirees also are great uh, partners. We uh, have a right retiree group at KCLS. They have two luncheons a year. And in exchange for doing their flyer, I do a little invitation flyer for them and mail it. They allow me to include information about planned giving and also um, regularly ask me to come to the luncheons and speak about what the a library update and information about plan giving and we've actually received a large and recent bequest from one of the retirees so it's been a great resource for us and obviously you know you want to to have a successful plan giving program, you have to have meaningful connections and relationships with your donors. And um, understanding their motivations is really, really important and connecting them to your mission. So volunteers and friends group are a built in automatic group for you. They already know your mission, they already know your priorities, and they believe in it strongly and give their time and their talent to your organization. So they're great. And then finally, if you are looking at your whole donor Donor base and it's overwhelming to you to think about who to focus on I would suggest you do an RFM model so there are lots of tools out there on the internet where you can actually download it's an Excel process there's a formula that you um, use to determine us and get a number for each of your donors on a scale of 0 to 300 and the you know the the key here is donors who make small gifts uh, small annual gifts over a long period of time, regardless of the amount, make strong candidates. And it's just proven to be true over and over again. When we get notification of a planned gift, regularly their giving has been like $20 a year for, you know, 10 years or, or even longer. And so it really, it seems like a cliche, but it does tend to be the case. So they're a great group to reach out to. So on my next slide, I talk about, um, this is just an image of what our Literary Legends Society branding is. We have this six photos of these famous authors. And, you know, I, I just want to mention that, you know, when someone notifies us of, an, of a planned gift, I add them to my major gift portfolio and I treat them the same as my major donors. You know, I invite them to special events. I um, provide them with library updates, like David was mentioning about insider information. I try to always share information before it gets out into the general public. Like just recently this week, we had a update on our reopening schedule. And when I got the information, it was public information, but yet hadn't been out uh, fully through our social media challenges cha channels. I sent it out to our um, plan giving and major donors um, just so that they knew what was up they want to know. And then, you know, regular correspondence like birthday and holiday cards, I continue to just touch base with them because they're revocable gifts and they could change at any time. So I just want to make sure that they have my name and my information if they have any questions um, and make myself available to them. The other thing I want to mention about this is to honor communication and recognition preferences. So ask people if they want to be anonymous, ask them how they'd like to be listed um, on your list. So for example, we have a few uh, people who want to be listed as a family, like the Sherrick family, as opposed to Tom and Cindy Sherrick as, on the list. And so just make sure you honor that, make sure your donor database represents all of those things, and um, they, it's much appreciated. Um, one person, I do want to tell you a quick story about a donor uh, that we received planned gift from. Her name is Gloria Comengor. Um, Gloria came to me not long after I started at KCLS and let me know that she had included us in her estate plan. She had moved to Seattle many, many years ago. Her husband worked at Boeing and they never had any children and she was a, a very active member of the friends group in one of our libraries. Um, when her husband passed away, she ended up moving from this area to Madras, Oregon. We stayed in touch. You know, Gloria really liked to write letters, and so I wrote letters back and forth with her. And it just so happens that one of my very close friends lived in the Seattle area or in the Madras area, and so I stopped uh, on my way to visit my friend and visited in her home. Um, lovely person. She passed away at the end of last year. We knew we were in her estate, but did not know what the specifics were. But it turned out that she had left a third of her estate 
or a third of uh, her charitable giving went to her a childhood library, a third went to the KCLS Foundation where she lived and spent a lot of her time uh, as an adult. And then when she retired and moved to Madras, Oregon, she left a third of her estate to Madras, Oregon. So it was beautiful. We actually received her IRA. We were a beneficiary on her IRA. We were a beneficiary on her life insurance and a beneficiary of her Bank of America accounts. And so it ended up being about $300,000 that we received in this calendar year, which as you all know, has been just a weird year. So we were just thrilled and delighted um, that that worked out the way it did. So, so now I'm gonna talk about our overall results. This chart shows you how much we have received through planned gifts. Uh, by year and you'll see there's years where we have zero and there are years that we have a small amount and there are years where we had over a hundred thousand dollars and then this year like I mentioned earlier we had this gift of three hundred thousand dollars from Gloria Comingor's estate you know um, this whole thing adds up to a little over 1.2 million dollars um, a lot of the gifts that represented here were the work of my predecessors and a lot of the work I'm doing right now won't show up for years and I guess that is such a big part of this you know plan giving requires patience and even though you're getting expectancies right now they will not come through for many many years and your board needs to understand and support that um, you know we continue to confirm expectancies uh, we have 40 members of our Literary Legends Society right now. We have two pending bequests that will come through in 2020, in addition to Gloria's. Um, and what's not on this chart, because it makes my chart weird, I don't like it, is that in 2018, we were notified of a large estate gift by a donor who left her entire estate, which is valued at $35 million, to 10 nonprofits. We're one of those 10, and so is Seattle Public Library. So obviously libraries meant a lot to this donor. Um, we were, each will receive an estimated $3.5 million, which will double our endowment. It's a transformational gift. We're thrilled. We've already received a few partial distributions. It's a big estate. It'll take many years to actually com be complete, but in the meantime, the, the, the bank and the law firm um, have been releasing uh, money. We just got a gift last week of $300,000 from that estate. So here's the kicker. Uh, the donor that we received the large estate from had given us one gift, one gift in 2010 for $35. We did not know her. We did not know we were in her estate. She uh, was a poet uh, as a hobby, went to our library for a poetry group for many years and very much appreciated the, the role the library played in her community. So I'm gonna end with that really uh, great story uh, and wish you all that many, many estates like that in your future. Um, David and I are happy to talk offline um, to any of you if you have specific questions or want more information. Um, our contact information is listed on this last slide, which will be in your conference material, I'm sure. And David, did you have anything you wanted to add before we start questions? Uh, just real quick, um, th thank you for all of the real-time examples and, and the encouragement. Um, I, I think it's great that you, you know, it's maybe the reason that you had to move virtual isn't great. Obviously, that's not great. But the fact that you had 350 folks, you went from 50-ish, right, to 350, um, right at the beginning of this sort of quarantine stay-at-home time, I think that sort of builds on what we saw in the in the Google Trends. There's actual demand here. Uh, and I guess for me, I, I just want to encourage you to not think about this as like self-serving for the library. I actually want you to think about it as serving your patrons. Um, and I think that number demonstrates that there's interest. This is this is a thing that is hard. And and regretfully, like like lots of industries, there's a lot of charlatans out there that are like you know, selling living trust and doing all these things and some things that people don't need. And I think the library is a safe place. It's a great place to learn this. So I don't want us to get hung up on, I mean, we protect privacy, you know, to the nth degree, which is a good thing. That's like a value in this space. Um, but this isn't violating that. This is actually just presenting opportunities. It's not a strong arm thing. So I just wanted to thank you for sharing that and sort of celebrate even though it was not necessarily a great reason that you had to go virtual, but the impact that that had, I think that's fantastic. 
We're moving then, forward with those quarterly too webinars. I that's perfect. I think that's fantastic. And then it's just interesting to me, and and I didn't know that this was going to be the case, right? So I had said what other institution has had lifelong impact. And then you told us about the the, the gal that left the three hundred thousand dollar gift to her childhood library, the library where she spent most of her like kind of working career years, and then her retirement library. Yeah. And that's my point. We sometimes, you know, we, it's easy to just think of like where we are right now at this point in time, our library, but libraries probably have had a lifelong impact on a lot of folks. And I just want, you know, that's the kudos to the library world, right? That that happened. And you mentioned the other gift too. So I just wanted to celebrate those things. Thank you for sharing those. Um, I'm hoping that some of the experiences that King County has had will inspire others to, to sort of be involved in this world. So I guess that's, that's my final thoughts. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I think we're going to take some questions now. So, hi everyone. Uh, Christina here. We are going to take some questions now. Very excited to talk to Cindy and David. All right. Cindy, I think you are out there, my friend. Hello, lovely lady. Hi. And then David, um, let me just go ahead and find you. So, Cindy and David, we have quite a lot of questions from everyone. David, as I pull you up, I'm going to throw one out to the both of you. Um, and David, actually, this one might be a little bit more for you, but the question is, do you anticipate fewer gifts from IRA distributions with the waiver in place through the end of the year? I mean, possibly for this year, but that's, it's literally just a one-year thing. So I you know possibly this year, but I think we still, I think we still promote it. There's still going to be people that'll want to would rather give, you know, to the library. Uh, the the reality is, and this is sometimes hard to understand, is like there's a lot of people who actually just don't need their IRA. So if they know you need it, the, I think they'll still do it. Okay. Because there's no there's no there's no reason why they couldn't. They can still make the gift. The IRA okay. Uh, another question, and we really do have like 10 or 12 questions, so it's wonderful. So uh, for either of you, how do you identify which donors have a donor advised fund? Is there a way to search within Fidelity Charitable or a community foundation? Not, with that, not that I'm aware of, David. No. Yeah, there's, there, there's not, um, which is, you know, one of many reasons why folks do use donor advised funds. Um, so this, here, there's one obvious thing and then one work thing, right? Um, so we work with a lot of clients, even on database issues. And when I ask them how they're, you know, marking their gifts that come in from donor advised funds, a lot of times they just aren't taking the time to note that, you know, that this was a, you know, Schwab or Fidelity Charitable Gift Fund. And sometimes the cover letter tells you, sometimes it don't. Sometimes you can call and ask. As long as the donor didn't ask to be uh, anonymous, they'll, they'll sometimes tell you. So sometimes it's just a little bit of work if you've already gotten gifts that way and making sure you know, you know, tagging, you know, your patrons that give to you that way already. And then the other way, we've actually started using surveys to do that. So we'll actually ask our patrons if they have a donor advice fund uh, in a survey about with some other things related to planned giving. And, you know, not everybody will tell you and not everybody will complete the survey, but some will. So as long as your sample set's large enough, you'll start finding out that way. So paying attention and then ask them. Okay. Uh, David, there is definitely, I think this one is for you because it came in during the beginning when you were speaking. And again, it seems more of a legal question. Um, and then Cindy, I think there's quite a few questions that came in during your portion. But David, can you explain briefly how the IRA minimum distribution works? Um, was that the question? I saw a question that was related to the age. Was that part of it or? There is one. Did the SECURE Act change the RMD age to 72? It did for individuals who reach 70 and a half after December 31st. So the timing of the initial required minimum distribution will now be 72, not 70 and a half, you know, kind of going forward. So, and required minimum distribution is just the age when, so IRAs, the whole idea with the IRAs, the money sits there and grows tax free until you take it out. And it used to be at 70 and a half, you had to start taking it out. And now it's 72 effectively. So that's, that's what it is. Did, is that both questions? Do we get them both or not? Uh, that is both questions. Let me see. I'm going to, and David, someone does ask, and, and I think we can both answer this question. Does your company offer these services from analyzing the database for prospecting to prepping materials to helping with the website? 
Yeah, I think we, we both can help with that, right? Yes, absolutely. And you come at this with an actual legal background, as you mentioned. So you're the man for the job. Yeah. Okay. We do. And we have partnerships with um, other firms that can, can do some screening services as well. So there's there's a lot we can do. But I think the, the survey piece, you know, that's part of that's part of why you heard me talk a lot about the adult programming part. I actually do think this is a library service. Um, I think it's legit. And I think those people, you could, you could do a survey before they come in or before they go out and ask them the questions about donor advised funds and some of the other things, make sure you've got their birthdays and all that. So I think, okay. I think there's a way to do this. Cindy, I'm going to switch to you now. And there are quite a few people that are interested in your, uh, yes, I'd love to review your policies if you don't mind. I'm in the process of creating all three. They've provided their email address, but then, um, yes, can you share your gift acceptance of policies and the resources? And as we're sitting here talking, can you, did you have any additional thoughts after we recorded this session? Anything that you want to share with the people regarding your policies and your resources? Um, it seems like everybody was most interested in accessing those from you. Well, I think, uh, Christina, I can upload them to the WUVA site, right? Is that right? Yes, yes. And, and okay, I can so, provide you, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, and, you know, I guess my recommendation is just to make sure you have them in place, even if they're basic, review them regularly. And, you know, try to get an estate planning attorney or sometime, some kind of an attorney on your board to help with that process. Right, right. So, Cindy, kind of a, an interesting question. Someone says, we were planning to do a planned giving mailing. I came upon a national news story about a university that did a planned giving mailing, and they were raked over the coals for being opportunistic given COVID. And I know that that's something we as an agency have dealt with. Um, have you adjusted your materials based on where we are now? And even after we did your reporting, any subsequent um, issues going on with the social justice movement and things like that. You know, how do you shift what you're doing? I feel like you're such an experienced fundraiser in this capacity. Well, we've definitely had a lot of conversations and staff meeting about, you know, what kind of message do we want out there and how do we want to adjust that, you know, but I think what David was saying and what David shared about it being a really popular search term right now and people really need this and you know the library is somewhere that they turn uh, for resources so we're trying to provide that we try not to make any kind of a hard sell you know we have a very short part of the agenda in our webinars you know about you know including kcls or the seattle public library in their state it's not it's not a hard sell but yeah i think you have to really be thoughtful and careful uh, another, yeah, David, do you have anything? No, I, I agree 100% with that. That's part of the thing. And, you know, I didn't see the, you know, the folks that did get ranked over the coals. I mean, if it was a pure, you know, you may die, put this in your will, of course. Um, but if it's like, we're here to serve you and we're going to help you through this time, um, you know, take care of you and take care of your family. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And uh, And I bet I bet it was all messaging and intent, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes those don't line up. Sometimes we can have the purest intention and our messaging's, you know, a little wonky. Uh, but I think if you have the right messaging, just like all the things that, um, you know, Cindy's talked about that they do in King County. Uh, I think that broad approach, like we're just trying to help you do your estate plan with the little small commercial and here's how you can include us if we've been meaningful. Um, that's the way to do it. And that, I, don't, I don't know what's offensive about that. And like I said, the numbers are the numbers. People want to know how to do it. And I think the library is the most trusted place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Cindy, question has come in for you. Um, how often do planned giving donors change their mind as time goes on? Oh, that's such a good question. And, you know, I had asked David this question when we were prepping for this presentation. And um, it, I mean, it's hard to know, right? How do we know? Unless we know that we've been included in their estate and then we're notified that we've been excluded from their estate, which rarely, rarely happens. Uh, it's hard to know, but David, did you have a stat on that? You had a... No, I, I, I keep looking for a stat and anything I've ever read is, is so anecdotal. Um, I, I don't know that we know because like you said, half the time you don't know that you're included. So we don't know when people go and change uh, as well. 
we do know that the number of times that like somebody thought there was a gift coming to them, you know, as long as you've maintained contact and had like a legitimate relationship with someone that they, that they tend to not change. Um, so uh, that's what we know. We know that if we, you know, treat people like people, they'll, you know, keep the relationship and we treat it like it's a true relationship and not a transaction that that supports it. So, but I don't know that we have like, you know, data, hard data with certainty around how many people change it. Um, I, I do know like what, what's happening out there uh, that could happen positive is way is worth that risk. So it's not like you're wasting your time because they could change it. Um, doing it actually tends to encourage more gifts, encourage more engagement, as long as you do your part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Cindy, another person has asked a question, and I think this is probably our final question. Can we join your next webinar about planned giving? Oh, of course, definitely. Um, check our website and we you can sign up. I mean, we're using Zoom as the platform. And so I think our maximum right now is 500 attendees. So as long as we don't hit our maximum, we'll be happy to <laughs> have any and all of you. Okay. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, there's one more question that's come in. Uh, do you, to either one of you, um, do you ever plan your estate planning around national library financial literacy programming? Not in the past, but we ha we are talking about, um, you know, making it a connection between National Wills Month, I think, and one of our webinars. We just were talking about that when we were planning. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, same. Okay. Oh, and guys, well, I'm sorry that we are at time. There are actually a ton of other people asking questions in our chat area. So we will have to get those to you so we can reply to these people. Um, everybody seems very interested. So I want to thank so much, um, Cindy and David. Thank you for speaking with us and sharing your experience. We had 120 people on this session, so it's very exciting that your knowledge was really spread all over North America. And um, if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.